Welcome to the Renewable Energy Financing Panel at the Global Energy Summit. It's my pleasure to introduce the, the panelists who are here today. <coughs> um, Malcolm Ball, Director of Energy Efficiency at Green Investment Bank. Stephen Lilly, Partner at Greencoat Capital. Paul Battelle, Director of Infrastructure and Energy Finance at Deutsche Bank. Matthew Hugh, Director of Onshore and M&A at EDF Energy Renewables. Ingmar Wilhelm, Managing Director at Terra Firma Capital. And Edward Ruiz, Director at First Reserve. And now I'll hand over to the moderator, Seb Henbest, Head of Europe, Middle East, and Africa at Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Welcome. Thank you very much, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to this panel on renewable energy financing. Um, I'm the moderator for the discussion. There's a lot of us, so uh, we'll do our best to give everyone as much floor time as possible, and hopefully you'll all learn something interesting. I'd like to spend a few moments setting the scene before we properly begin um, with the panelists. In uh, 2013, we saw about $251 billion invested in clean energy projects and companies worldwide. But that was the second year in a row that investment had fallen from a peak in 2011. We're likely to see an uptick this year, um, but when we think about the total volume of investment needed to head off uh, the, the, the dangerous effects um, of, of climate change, we're talking about doubling that level of investment by 2020 and then doubling it again to 2030 to around sort of a trillion, a trillion dollars a year. And that's no small task, so there's still some, some work to do. But if the fall of investment globally has been a bit of a cloud um, over the last couple of years, there are some silver linings. And I just want to run through some of the, some of the uh, uh, trends that we're, that we're seeing, of which we'll talk about as a group in a lot more detail. Firstly, the, the cost of manufacturing and deploying solar and wind technologies uh, has been falling fast. The, the levelised cost of energy for solar PV is down about 53%, um, and wind down about 15% in the last five years. So to illustrate the significance of that, in 2013, for the first time, we saw not only record deployment of solar PV, but also a 20% drop in total investment. Uh, when we think about the payback periods for rooftop solar, when we think about the economics of large-scale wind and solar, I mean, these technologies are now competitive with conventional assets in many parts of the world, um, and we expect uh, that sort of trend to, to continue. We also saw some strong growth in non-traditional markets. Uh, we're all used to there being a lot of investment in coming out of China. Uh, but when we ignore China and India, in the Asia-Pacific, we saw a 47% uptick in investment to 43 billion, and that's just below what China spent uh, in 2013 at 56 billion, uh, and that's just less than what the whole European Union spent. So uh, certainly there are parts of the world that are starting to engage in the renewable energy uh, sector. Uh, and just by the by, it's looking likely that China is going to set a bit of a record this year, so uh, investment certainly has picked up there, particularly in solar. We also saw a recovery in public markets uh, over 2013, and again, uh, things are looking uh, steady into this year. Uh, share prices for clean energy equities uh, were up 54% after things had been looking pretty bearish for about four, four or five years, um, and many companies in the wind and solar value chain who had been uh, burnt really pretty badly by changes in, in, in policy regimes um, and this over, over capacity in the supply chain started to return to profitability. Uh, we've also seen uh, the emergence of some innovative financing vehicles, and we've got a few people on the panel who are going to talk about these in a bit more detail. Uh, the US Yield Co model um, has seen a number of IPOs and, and raised um, a, a significant amount of capital. In the UK, I think there's been six funds listed, um, one and a half billion pounds worth um, of investment. Uh, alongside that, green bonds uh, continue to grow. Uh, we saw $14 billion issued last year. This year, uh, a number we put out a, a few months back was an expectation of $37 billion for 2014. So that's, <coughs> of course, more than doubled. Um, and I'm not sure what we're at at the moment, so I don't want to say uh, that's our forecast for now, because we might already be there. You never know. Uh, and also, development banks have been investing strongly over a number of years. And uh, alongside them, we're seeing increased appetite 
for renewable energy from institutional investors like pension funds and insurance companies. Uh, and their contribution to the sector is, is, is rising as well. But pushing up against those trends and those, those positives, if you like, are, um, is an inconsistent policy environment, particularly here in Europe, uh, which is increasing risk and, and slowing activity. Um, so we're going to try and discuss some of these, these trends in, in, a, in a bit more detail. The panel has already been introduced to you. Uh, there's, as I said, there's, there's a lot of us, so we'll try and cover as much ground and we'll leave some questions uh, time for questions at the end. But let's start, I guess, at a, at a high macro level and, and paint the picture in a bit more detail. So um, Inga, Inga Wilhelm, uh, until 2012, Europe was the sort of leading investor in renewable energy. There was a peak of 130 billion um, in 2012. Since then, there's been a precipitous collapse in investment volume. Um, and in Q3 this year was the lowest quarter since mid-2006. You've been in the industry a long time. You were with NL Green Power um, before your current role. Talk to us about what has changed over the last five years or so uh, in Europe in particular. Yeah, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, of course, a lot has changed over the last uh, five years uh, in Europe. Um, I think... Uh, we should start from the political um, motivation. In Europe, we were very uh, decided to help the world by reducing uh, emissions, and uh, therefore we had very um, strong and binding, and we have them still, uh, emission targets. And uh, based on that uh, overriding principle, we then introduced across Europe many ways to incentivize renewable power generation. And uh, that was done by people, uh, well, I would say working for the good on the one hand, and uh, on the other hand, not really knowing how fast technologies can develop. This is perhaps the most important element when we talk about renewable power generation today. It's about technologies. And the shift in technologies that we have seen over the last decade is simply disruptive. And you see this, for example, if you look into the balance sheets of the utilities today, how hard they are hit. Why? Well, also because renewables have, ha have seen that uh, important rise. Now, regulation um, is a difficult topic in any case, and it was done on the basis of time constants, which were, well, a technology beat gas-fired, coal-fired, power generation on nuclear, where you rather have to think in terms of decades and not just years, uh, adapting slowly. So the drive down of cost, in particular of solar PV, but also of wind, wind onshore and wind offshore, I would uh, think will take a similar development, has been so fast, and the markets did not operate with limited amounts of capacity or auctions in order to introduce some competition among the different proponents, so that you've got a wide and, I would say, very easy playing field for whoever wanted to participate. And this is clearly not a very efficient way of allocating, well, the money from all of us, because, after all, we are bill payers, and uh, somebody's got to, got to pay for this. The incentives are normally sourced across Europe from whoever pays the bills. And, uh, well, after five years of very intense build-up of uh, renewable power generation, we feel it. We see it in our bills, and in fact, the portion, for example, in Germany, of the renewable incentive is now bigger than the portion that you pay for the electricity itself. So I think uh, the lack of a attention or an understanding of the dynamics of the disruptiveness of the cost curve of technologies that we then saw at all levels of ministries, certainly not helped by the many lobbyists around asking for ever more and no thresholds, no caps on capacity, well, led to a situation that we're in today, which then created exactly the opposite effect of what I think most people wanted, that people said, no, no, no well, we have to stop. Now I think we're doing here too much. Now that's not good. And it's very expensive and it's inefficient. So, no, I think this is the situation we're in today. Um, nevertheless, we have created, I think, a decent understanding of those mechanisms. Uh, we have created in some parts of Europe industries 
not only developers, not only in certain cases still operating manufacturers, but a lot of investors, which are, by the way, around today. And, uh, well, I think uh, having gone through that development, we are well prepared to, well, export this knowledge and understanding to other markets where we see, in fact, most of the development. There are two, the, the renewable power generation today, if we put it apart, um, large hydro is a $2 trillion asset class. As you said, there are over 100 gigawatt of new capacity every year for different renewable technologies installed around the globe. Over 200 billion of dollars every year of new investment. The capacity, by the way, is increasing, rather. The, the total investment is not increasing. It has it decreased a little bit over the last two years, but this is because the capex intensity has gone down. Per megawatt, you have to invest less dollars. And uh, we now see two major trends. One is internationalization, or rather globalization. We have ever more countries around the globe, in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, participating in this thrive for renewable power generation. And in addition to that, we see consolidation. So people putting together assets, building up scale, concentrating competences, and I think there are very different competences here around the table, in order to make that an ever more efficient industry. I think you touched on a lot of different areas there that we'll come back to um, over the next hour or so. Um, Paul Battelle, can you chime in? Are we in a more sustainable place now in Europe than we were a few years ago? Uh, it depends, I think, a little bit on, what, on how you want to uh, talk about sustainability. I think the, fundamentally at the moment the energy markets in Europe um, are probably, it's probably difficult to describe them as stable. Um, they have their challenges. Um, you look at the Euro Central European power price at the moment, you look at the effect that uh, it's had on, on their balance sheets and on their uh, profitability of the major major utilities. Um, so so if, it is a, if it is a sustainable and stable place, it's not a particularly comfortable place for a lot of utilities. Um, I think what we've seen on, from, a, you know, from taking a sort of narrow review of it from a banking perspective, um, you know, we've seen over the over the same period that we were talking about a really a, an improvement in the in the quality of projects that are coming to us. We're seeing more professional developers. We're seeing better technologies. Uh, we're seeing cost digressions that make you know, projects make more sense on a standalone basis. And so, um, you know, the the market has certainly moved to a better place in terms of renewable projects and the sustainability and, and the the sort of long term nature of them, um, which which is good. Um, but as, as, as Ingmar has, has alluded to, it, it has created challenges to the wider market. And then always when we're looking at renewables these days, there's an increased focus on auctions, an increased focus on market risk. And that market risk element, when we look at long-term low European power prices and, and, and the development of those over time and the uncertainty around the development of, of those over time, there is now a feedback loop where that is affecting renewable projects as well, um, where in the past renewable projects had a relatively easy ride in terms of their market risk elements that they were needing to, to, to look at. Now that, that's becoming more difficult for them, and I think that is a challenge you know, for not just renewable projects, but for the, uh, for the sector generally, um, when a European power price is going to rise again. Really. Just um, on the availability and the robustness of PPAs, so power purchase agreements, in a situation where the, the, the power price um, is being moved by the changes that we see, both at a, at a uh, from from the large scale renewable renewable technologies coming online, and of course the uh, the increase in, in distributed uh, rooftop solar, um, flattening demand, etc. How how easy is it to for, the, for for developers to get PPAs uh, in, in a market where the, where the underlying price is changing so much? I mean, I think um, you know, the prevalence of PPAs and the importance of PPAs is, is to some greater or lesser extent, a UK phenomenon. Um, you know, if you look at continental Europe, there are, are markets where PPAs have been a requirement for renewable projects, um, Sweden, um, you know, Poland, some other markets. But the UK has been probably the market where that question is, is most relevant. And I think we've seen some encouraging signs in the UK recently for the utilities have been coming back into the market offering PPAs. And we have a, a relatively competitive 
competitive space at the moment with perhaps five or six utilities offering PPAs, where in the past it was down to sort of one or two. Um, and so that, that's, that's good. Um, it's, a, it's good for everybody. And I think that there's some, you know, that's for both new style and old style. So people are coming in talking about CFDs and creating PPAs under the new CFD mechanisms we have in the UK. So, so there is still, a, still an appetite there from the utilities, an increasing appetite from the utilities to offer PPAs on terms that still make sense for the renewable projects because the renewable projects have that incentive mechanism from the government generally. I think if you look at the conventional sector and you look at PPAs and tolling agreements in the conventional sector, I think that is, that is more challenging um, where there isn't the incentives that are coming through from the government and you're looking simply at, at, at clean dark spreads or clean spark spreads, um, there, you know, there is appetite for PPAs, but the underlying economics of those PPAs bring through to projects in the conventional sector, I think is, are still challenging. Um, I can I just go back a step and, and talk a little bit more about the sort of regulatory situation in Europe um, and the impact of the retroactive changes that we saw in policy. And for those who are less familiar, um, uh, this of course has put significant, uh, uh, a significant black cloud over the industry in certain countries, particularly Spain, Italy, Bulgaria, Czech Republic. I think there's a, there's a number of them. Um, Math Mathieu, how important from your perspective is sort of the regulatory risk environment in Europe? And is this sort of instability where policy is changed on a regular basis, mechanisms are changed on a regular basis, a feature of the system or a bug? Well, I, I think we just need to uh, remember what uh, Igmar said. I mean, the uh, industry uh, is uh, evolu evolu ovulate. <laughs> there is an evolution in the industry. So we started 10, 15 years ago where we needed massive investment. And as uh, I said, you know, we had uh, mechanisms put in place with uh, some projection of what the cost of this uh, technology would be, they have evolved, uh, the situation has evolved, and people had to react more quickly than, than they thought they would, meaning that the investment uh, were higher than people thought they would be, um, and the cost of these support mechanisms were higher than anyone could afford. So uh, action had to be taken, so it's, the reasons are well understood. No, I think, it's, uh, I think everyone is aware of that. So when we look at the situation now, things are a bit different. People are looking at this risk differently. And when a new support mechanism is put in place, it is with uh, the lessons learned from the past and trying to make something that is more sustainable. So we have introduction of auctions uh, in, in a lot of countries, uh, not just in Europe, but uh, if we look in, uh, in Africa, especially South Africa, if we look at South America, uh, I mean, this is the sort of uh, mechanisms that are put in place and they are probably a lot more uh, adapted uh, to, uh, to the situation. So as investors, do we look at regulation risk? Of, obviously we do. Uh, do we see it as big as it was? I think we try to understand it better and not just take the regulation regime for, for given. We know that they, it might, might, may, may evolve in the future. So I think we, uh, we are a lot more realistic about uh, things. Um, I think what is important uh, for the confidence is that we avoid a situation where once again we've got to change the regulation regime. Because uh, if you burn once, you know, you, you're happy to learn from it. If you burn twice, you're probably not going to invest again. So I think that's probably where we are today. Is there an opportunity, um, I'll bring Edward on the, on the end, an opportunity in countries that have made these changes, where there are assets that are now in some form of distress, um, is there an opportunity for sort of specialist private equity players uh, to move in and to, to make good? Um, and in Italy, in the, in, you know, this year so far in Italy, there's been a number of acquisitions of wind and solar, solar plants. Well, I'm sure there are kind of bottom feeders in the market that kind of specialise in those type of distressed opportunities, but that's not the game that we would be participating in. I think that, you know, we would be looking at uh, markets like Spain and Italy kind of uh, out of bounds for us, uh, for, for new investments. You know, if we can't trust the regulator, how can we actually enter into a contract with them for future investments? So how can we actually even, you know, look at existing contracts and say, well, what, what are they worth? Um, so, you know, but yeah, there are... Uh, also, people coming into our offices with, uh, you know, fund ideas and investment ideas of trying to take, um, you know, uh, carcasses off the street and try to turn it into money. 
Um, and then there are opportunities because banks don't want to hold those um, uh, those uh, assets, and uh, but it's not the type of business that I would be investing in myself because you just don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, I mean, just look at Italy now. Uh, you know, we're just going through a whole process of uh, changes on the solar regulation, which is basically pretty much halving our equity return uh, on or expected equity return on those type of investments, which basically brings it below our kind of hurdle rate. So it's not really worth an investment that we sh or we shouldn't have done those investments. That that's the the, the, the bottom line. Um, and it, people say, well, that's it. It's only going to be solar because solar is subsidized to such an extent. Um, you know, it's only going to be solar. But you know, now they're talking about wind as well. So it's and, and the same thing happened in Spain. They started with solar and then they went after wind. And you know, now they're setting up a whole new system, which basically also in Spain completely changed changed the rules. So. Um, and, and we will probably see other countries where they will do the same thing. You know, in Bulgaria, we have a solar farm in, in Bulgaria. Uh, they basically, the day that we close the deal, or the day after pretty much, they set up a tax which was as high as the um, subsidy we got from the government. So basically, you know, offsetting the, the benefit um, that we would get and basically putting the uh, project pretty much into administration. Um, we went to, through a whole uh, Supreme Court process. We were actually won that from the government. And then, you know, a few months later, they invented something different to kind of uh, take the money back. So, and we're back in another process, and we're still waiting for our money to be released by the government. So, you know, I guess there's just certain countries where you don't want to take that type of risk. And we will be looking at uh, investments now a lot more um, in a way that we, how can we disintermediate the government from those transactions? So. Now, fortunately, you know, we invest in portfolios of companies, so it's not only Italy and Spain that we're doing. And you know, in our wind business, we also invested in Mexico. Um, and half of our wind business is in Mexico. And instead of having a, a feed-in tariff from a government, uh, we actually have PPAs in place for 17, 18 years with Walmart and Bimbo, which are our A-rated companies. Uh, and on the back of those investments, we were, we're actually getting quite a bit higher return than we expected, and there's a huge a refi opportunity with bonds at this moment in time, which will even push those investments high, uh, to a higher level. So on a portfolio basis, it still makes sense. But I think that also pro probably proves the concept that if you want to operate in this market, you probably want to have a bit of a portfolio so that you don't only take a bet on one market um, and you expose yourself to one regulator and one contract counterparty uh, as such. We'll come back, I think, to some of the opportunities beyond Europe, yeah. which you alluded to in just a moment. I just want to pose the same question to, to Inga. I mean, is there the countries that have made these changes were, and have burnt investors, are they blacklisted forever? Or are they, you know, how can they redeem themselves? Uh, and even if they tried, would you be interested? Um, and perhaps more broadly, are, is, there a, is the sense still in Europe that this could happen anywhere else? Yeah, this is a very tricky question, um, and I can tell you I'm, uh, I really spent some time thinking about it. I cannot say that I have come to a very simple conclusion. I would say, first of all, when you consider markets, you should look at uh, what is the capacity build-up over the next five to ten years. Therefore, which is already a, a, uh, a quite bold uh, uh, assumption, then you should ask yourself, well, what is the impact because of the incentives needed over forecasted wholesale power prices, that will finally need to be sourced from the clients. What is the relative impact on the electricity bill of those clients? If that goes over 20%, I would say the, the, the yellow and red lamps should go on. Um, who are your allies? Are you the biggest investor in the market? Are there in particular international investors, but not many locals? Or are there, in fact, good fellows from the country itself, both on the equity and also on the debt side? So whenever you've got more people around equity side as well as debt size in a country, you could say, well, you will not be the only one who will get hit, and therefore you might then defend yourself more effectively. Now, let's take the case of Italy. Uh, we are both investors in Italy, in solar PV. We are both hit in a similar way. Uh, we will both stand up and fight for the uh, rule of law 
And uh, there are two ways that you can do that. One is uh, that you go to the Constitutional Court in Italy, uh, which many people will do, and you can also activate the uh, energy treaty at a European level, and we will do that presumably as well. Um, I'm very confident that we will at least win one or even both. So, well, finally, rule of law still applies, and uh, if a government thinks it differently in a world which is today so interconnected and uh, where countries, in fact, benefit a lot from European treaties and even international treaties, well, sometimes you also feel that they go along with responsibilities. And I think this is exactly the case where we will uh, be, well, in two to three years' time. In the meantime, yes, you have to ask yourself, well, if the perception of the market is, in fact, that it's gone bad and that it will not come back, and it will perhaps even worsen, and effectively you think, well, the market perception is worse than what you think, well, this is an area of opportunity. So, therefore, the people you meet, I think I, I meet the same. There are many people around considering, considering this opportunity. It's certainly bad for the investment climate in Italy. Um, I would have appreciated a lot if more people would have pointed at this, because this is not limited to solar PV, this is not limited to renewable power generation, this is not re limited to power generation, it's not even limited to infrastructure investment in a country. So what you give away as a government when you introduce retrospection is you simply put at stake the confidence which all investors should have in front of what you can do in your country. There's one example, the Chinese now investing here and there in Europe in particular, also in Italy, also in the UK, uh, they asked this question. Perhaps not strong enough, but uh, a certain reaction of the investor community, you have it. And I think uh, the Italian government is now at a different level of uh, appreciation of the reaction than it was when it took the decision. That's a very good point. Um, Paul, you mentioned uh, what I sort of extrapolate to be a, a, a maturing in the industry, better projects, uh, cheaper finance, um, lower technology costs. Um, can you comment from the perspective of a, of, of a bank, how things have changed from your perspective and, uh, you know, particularly in terms of with the cost of debt today being so low, what are the ramifications of that going forward for the industry? Yeah, no, it's, um, it's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I think it is fair to say that the overall cost of debt at the moment is, is, is I don't think it's at all time lows, but it's in, it's in, it's in, a, in a reasonably good place for people. Um, and really the net effect of that is both in terms of you know, M&A opportunities, we're seeing people able to finance the acquisition of assets at, at, at prices. Um, where we didn't see them in the past, uh, and so, so there's some very attractive, uh, or you know, if, you're, if you own wind farms and, and solar assets in Europe at the moment, uh, and you, you you bought them a number of years ago, um, the current valuations of those, based on current uh, interest rates and, and, and debt assumptions, are probably significantly above where 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 you were when you, when you bought them, and I think that's uh, that's good for the sector. I think there's a, there's a slight danger there that um, when governments and regulators now look at the prices that people are paying for those assets, they may infer that uh, the cost of capital for those assets and, and, and the overall returns that investors need are have, have dropped significantly. And therefore, when they come to the next regulatory review, they decide to you know that the, the, the whatever incentive mechanism they're putting in place uh, should offer a lower incentive to investors uh, in that space. space. So, so there is a, a little bit of a danger there. But it, you know, you look at the values that people are paying for wind in, in the UK, uh, wind in Germany at the moment, and it is significantly above uh, where it was a couple of years ago, and a, a large piece of that is down to interest rates and the cost of debt, where, where actually base interest rates is an, is an important part of that. It's not just that the banks are giving money away more cheaply than they were in the past. I think base interest rates and what the ECB and, and the various um, you know, central banks are doing has, has been a, a very important factor in that overall all, all reduction. Um, other than that, I think you know, the, the, the cost of debt um, 
when you look at new build projects, uh, it, it is important, and people are making projects work now uh, at that overall lower cost of debt. Uh, if, 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 if debt prices spiked um, significantly, uh, quite a number of projects wouldn't have the same level of economics. It wouldn't be as attractive to the equity investors around the table um, uh, as they are at the moment. So I think it is uh, that that cost of debt is supportive of, of new build projects uh, generally, and, uh, and that's a good thing for everyone around the table, I think. So, so concurrent to that is the uh, situation with utilities, and I promise I'm coming to this side of the, uh, of the ledger in a moment. Um, but back to Matthew just quickly. Um, you know, the utilities have traditionally been sort of big investors in the energy sector. Um, but when we look at, on aggregate, in Europe, what is being invested over the last three to four years is down about a third. There are some who are going up, some are going down, but overall it's going, it's going down. Can you just explain a little bit about why that's going on and particularly um, any uh, synergies or any, any, any relationship to what Paul just mentioned then? Yep. Well, uh, utilities in Europe have a large balance sheet, but I think they are also constrained. But I don't think this is necessarily the main driver to, to um, uh, a decrease in the proportion of investment coming from utilities. Well, I think what we see is a um, you know, context which is more, more favorable to, uh, to uh, new investors to come in. Uh, they see a relatively mature market with mature technologies, with lower risk, and a lot of people come in to invest in operational assets. So I think the business model of the utilities, and uh, I mean EDF uh, had, has had this business model for some time, which was to develop, uh, build this project and operate this project, but also to recycle uh, their investment by bringing uh, investors um, once a project was operational is something that mo now most utilities do. So meaning, for example, uh, at EDF, I think we have invested 2.5 billion, or that sort of number, last year in renewables, but we uh, disposed of 1.5 billion of, of assets. Uh, so I don't think it's necessarily impacting the uh, level of, uh, of investment uh, overall. I think the, the, the role of the utilities to invest and bring projects uh, is still there and is still uh, very active. Uh, what is welcome for utilities in, in the context uh, of uh, their balance sheet and the requirements for the investment, which is not just re renewables but a lot more, is to have people, investors capable of coming in, bringing cheap uh, uh, financing, uh, so that there is a decent return for, for the utilities who take a risk, uh, the regulation risk, the development risk, the construction risk, and then it can be rewarded by people coming in at a later, uh, later stage with a risk that is manageable and understood relatively well, uh, and that, that allow to, to keep some, some level of investment. Now in Europe, I think the problem is probably that uh, as, as we know, regulation regime has changed, and so the, you know, the number of opportunities to invest is limited. So what we see, for example, at EDF is you know, we, we, uh, we invest in 18 countries, uh, and the, the best investment at the moment are not necessarily in Europe. We, we are looking at Asia, we are looking at North America, South America, we are looking at uh, uh, Africa, Middle East. Uh, so I think the, the utility is still looking for investment, and interestingly, it's not necessarily in Europe that, uh, where they find their investment. Again, we'll, we'll come back to sort of uh, th things further afield, international nature of these, uh, th this industry in a moment, but if I can move to my right, to, to Stephen Lilly, um, is the... Matthew may have just answered this question, and you may completely <laughs> agree with him. I think he's wrong, but... Uh. Like, ooh. Uh, <laughs> Is that drop in investment from the utility sector a problem uh, in your view? I know that it was a common discussion topic. Where's the capital going to come from if the utilities aren't investing? Where are well, we? I, I, think the, I think Matthew's right, actually, in the, in the sense that uh, the, I think the utilities are uh, still investing. I think that uh, uh, one thing I would disagree with, we, we have found um, prices for operating assets has, have gone down, actually, from what we've been looking at um, over the last two years. But I think that sort of to some extent, talks to the strategy that we follow to be uh, independent, to be across the piece, to be able to buy from anybody. So we have sort of found some sort of niches in the UK wind market um, where, where we've actually found um, our IRRs have gone up, not down, in, in, in the last two years. Sorry, can you speak up, please? Yeah, sure. Um, sorry, I'll get a bit closer to the, to the mic. Um, I was just saying that we, we've, we've actually found prices have gone for, for what we're buying have gone have gone down because we've been very specific in, and been the sort of breadth of looking across the whole of the 
of the UK wind sector. I mean, we very much took the view, um, if you sort of stu stood back uh, four or five years, that, that, that certainly the, and I'm talking about UK wind specifically here, um, what you had is, 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 is an industry that was um, almost entirely um, uh, the, the operating assets owned by, by utilities, um, the view that developers might develop and maybe the utilities might develop, but they would be the long-term owners because they have the customers. Now, clearly, if you look at how much uh, wind has to be built out um, through to 2020, and the number is probably £60 billion worth of assets, the utilities are not going to be able to fund all of that. So we, we looked at that and thought, actually, the thing that we should do is, is, um, <coughs> is, is build, build the right long-term owner of operating assets, so looking into the um, a, a perpetual money, so not into the sort of P world where you have a 10-year recycle of capital, but, but, but the equity capital markets that is, that is effectively perpetual um, and is also much bigger in scale. Also then looking at uh, what type of structure in that and, and, and looking at a world where um, income funds and, and retail actually like to buy into that type of cash flow uh, and, and really sort of modelling the PFI uh, funds that had gone in, in, in before um, and, and putting a product into the market that was similar to that. But the, the real sort of point, I guess, was that is, is, is building something that, that can, can take the unlevered characteristics of the cash flow from a wind farm and match it against effectively liability matching against pension funds, against income, against, against uh, um, private investors is, is, is a very attractive uh, proposition. And by doing that, utilities will recycle capital, as, as Mathieu is saying, um, and, and will build more. And, 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 and the whole of it is, is, is a loop that helps everyone. It helps investors because there's product there but it also helps utilities to recycle capital. So that's what we sort of saw as, as a sort of macro theme. I think where I would slightly disagree with, and I think this is where we get to the point of, we think, we think for us the IRRs have gone up since our listing, is, is that um, the, the requirement for, for build out in the UK wind market is so big that actually it's, it, we see from a wind perspective, and this isn't true for solar, but certainly from a wind perspective, um, it is very much, is agreeing with me, um, very much uh, a buyer's market in the, wind, in the wind sector, so that's why we see our IRRs have gone up. Um, uh, pro probably not down. I think that isn't the case in the solar market. It's not as big, um, and it certainly isn't the case anymore in the PFI sector um, because there's, uh, there isn't the size of market. But this is really sort of a market-driven thing. It's such a big market. Utilities can't do everything. They're still doing an awful lot. But where we can fit in is, is to, be the, be, to be either a co-investor or a, a buyer of assets or we can fit in the mix and, 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 and introduce a new type of capital into the sector. Can you go back a step for people from there? Of course. And just spell out a little bit um, what it is that you've created. Yeah. In particular, um, I, I, we were talking earlier, and I'm, I'm not allowed to call it this, but the, a yield co-model, and you can tell us why um, I'm not allowed to call it that, but um, <coughs> explaining what that is uh, and how successful it had, you know, these models have been so far in the UK, um, and what, you, what, what your anticipation of yeah. the uptake and outlook for them is. Okay, so we, as I sort of said a minute or two ago, we, we looked at sort of the model in the PFI sector, so the biggest fund in the PFI sector is, that is a, uh, a business that started with HSBC, um, but buying schools, hospitals, roads, bridges, etc. That started in 2007 with £250 million of equity. It's, it's raised capital over the last seven years. It's now nearly two billion pounds of market capital, uh, market capitalization. That's a model that has just been very simple. It's produced dividend, uh, growing dividend year on year on year, capital preservation. Um, investors um, who are thinking about buying bonds um, who are, uh, and, and government gilts that are producing you know, 1%, something that's producing 6%, especially if you have a pension fund, for instance, that's got um, uh, liability matching problems and, and, and a 5% requirement effectively. That's actually a very good product and that's why it's been so popular. So we sort of looked at that and thought actually that type of product where we, um, from the cash flow say from a wind farm, so if you work into the mathematics, if you, if you have an IRR of 9% for an asset that's 25 years in life, what that is equivalent to is 9% every single year with £100 back at the end. That's just what an IRR is. But actually, a wind farm doesn't look like that. It produces probably 11%, and it's, produced, and, and it's worth nothing at the end, probably. So actually, your yield is 11%. So what we have then done is, is from that 11%, 11 we pay a 6p dividend. We have space to increase that with RPI every year. So this last year was 6.2%. Next year, it'll be um, mechanically, whatever that is, 6.4%, probably, whatever RPI will be. 
Um, and, and then of that five percent, of that five percent, the difference between the, the eleven the cash that comes in and the six we pay as dividend, we've reinvested that in, 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 in new projects that we bought. Um, by doing that, what we have is is the asset value of the business going up year on year on year um, by by five percent, although there is two percent depreciation on the current assets. So that's a sort of simple model. And so what it gives investors is very stable, very stable dividend at 6p increasing with RPI, so there's, there's, there's inflation protection there as well. Um, and then they've got capital that is actually growing with RPI as well. So it's a very, very straightforward product. That's something that people <coughs> find very attractive and, and, and like. Now the reference to yield cares um, is, is an interesting one because that's a term that has been coined in the States predominantly. Um, and, and some of the stuff that's been going on in the States um, beg, beggars belief to some extent in the capital markets over there. In the UK, what you would expect, and, and this is actually what's seen, um, generally the share price is, is, is pretty, pretty similar to what your assets are worth. So what's called the premium to the net asset value, the NAV, is probably 4 and 5% for the share price, the difference between the two. In the States, um, what, what seems to have happened is that investors look at that 11% yield, they look at the time window, which is four or five years perhaps, and they say that 11 that 11% that yield is absolutely fantastic. Um, I want it for five years. I'm going to pay 5% um, you know, for that effectively, and the share price has doubled. Now, what that seems to be missing is the fact that these are wind farms that are worth nothing in 25 years, and, and, and actually what you've got is um, uh, people effectively that are... As long as, as long as they recognise that fact before the whole of the rest of the market recognises that fact, that's a great investment because you'll have paid 100p for it, you'll have sold it at, at 200p and you've made a huge return. It, has all the, it also has all the characteristics of a Ponzi scheme. Um, so so, so it, it is quite concerning in many ways that when, when that is happening. <laughs> Fortunately in the UK, um, that hasn't happened, but predominantly because we have birthed our sector. And the, and the two billion pounds that sort of follow, followed on from us um, has, has, has been birthed from a PFI sector where it's been understood. You have a concession, it's a schools concession to say, that goes back to the, you built, you built the school, it goes back to the, to the local authority at the end, it's worth definitely nothing. And so investors understand, I think, you, you know, yield goes in this country, and that's why we're trading at a 5% or whatever premium to the net asset value. At some stage, the Americans will understand it. Um, I mean, that's a crass generalisation, and there's and there's all sorts of complexity in there, but there's certainly quite a bit of truth in that. Um, you then get to sort of the point of when, whenever you sort of say that to people, that, that some of the response back is is well, actually, it's it's because we have a pipeline that we can sort of we can feed feed the vehicle, and actually, you should just the the, the only beneficiary of a pipeline is the parent that owns it in the beginning. Because the, the, all that will happen is the parent will sell the, the pipeline to, to, the, to the yield co at market price. And unless you believe in alchemy, that's also worth zero. So, so you know, ultimately, all that's happening is people, are, I think, are confusing. Um, uh, uh, the theme is people are confusing, or they're just looking at the five-year window. And the thirst for income, especially in the States, is so huge um, that they're sort of ignoring, ignoring the problem. Have I explained that well enough, though? Does that make sense? We'll give you an opportunity to ask complex <laughs> questions a little, a little bit later. Um, the IPOs, there's been a number of, 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 of these funds put together now over the last year or two. Not all the IPOs have reached target. Is it fair to say that there is strong appetite for these types of assets, considering that? Yeah, I think ab absolutely. I think you probably the six that are there now are the six that will be there. Um, uh, we've got three three solar funds that are uh, a fair bit smaller than us. We've got a couple that are effectively related to um, parents. Effectively, those pipelines sort of comes from there. We're, we're an independent solar business. Um, we don't really think of ourselves as a fund in some ways. We think of ourselves as a as a UK wind um, IPP that will within the next six months probably enter the FTSE 250. So that that's how we sort of think of ourselves. We don't call ourselves a fund, um, and, unlike some of the other funds, I guess. Um, we, that's someone's phone, but uh, I'll ignore it. It's definitely not mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's three solar funds. Is there, should there be two? Don't know. I mean, I think they all sort of seem to be sensible. Um, so, so hopefully, as long as they sort of work out how to get on with each other, I think they'll be perfectly fine. 
Um, it, it seems to me a theme that if you actually looked in the wider sector, going back to the infra, infra world, um, the, P, the PPP world, um, in the past you've seen them raising a fair bit of money every year, uh, year on year, and, and that has been, it's been interesting to note there's been less deals done, done in that sector, and there's been a lot less capital raised this year. And it feels to me that, that maybe if there's a theme, that, that what we've got is um, there is a need for people to invest for income, and it has been satisfied by the PFI sector in the past. Um, where you're getting to us, it's becoming quite scarce. It feels to me that that source of money will come to us as long as we do exactly as we've said on the tin. Um, and, and, and as we have, an, have, have a history of paying dividends, of growing now, of, of doing good deals, that money should be available, I, I, I would think. I mean, we've certainly grown from 260, and, and 260 million pounds in March, March 13 to a market coming as 5, 520, 525. So that's sort of doubled in time. We have we had six assets at the beginning. We now have 16. Um, there's, there's plenty to buy, and, the, and there's plenty of equity investment there. Yeah. Last question for you on this: yeah. Do we expect, and what would the barriers to an expansion of this model beyond the US and the UK as it is today? <coughs> it, it, it's an interesting question, isn't it? Because I think. It, yeah, it's an interesting, perhaps you could move towards the front, perhaps. Um, it's an, it is an interesting question, uh, perhaps, uh, because I don't think it's necessarily just about the, 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 the structure of the, of the, of the uh, uh, utility market or, or the, the renewable market. I think it's also a, a question about the capital markets um, and, and the depth of the capital markets. Clearly, in the US and the UK, those are very strong. Um, so this is the obvious place that it would work. Could it work in Amsterdam? Could it work in Dublin? Possibly. I think that it's also a question about the capital markets. We'll see, I guess, is the answer. Okay. Malcolm, it's been a long time. Um, you've been very patient, but I wanted to bring you in on this topic, but also just more generally to start with. Development banks um, have played a pretty important role uh, supporting the whole sector throughout the financial crisis. And one of the reasons we didn't see global investment drop um, post-2008 was because of the work of, of, of uh, the development banks. Um, can you comment briefly on how you see the, the, their role and the role of, sort of the Green Investment Bank evolving? And also, I know that you have some involvement in, in this non-yield co, UK yield co type model, and if you could talk about that as well. Sure, be... so I'm quite happy to link the two together. Um, <coughs> since we're an investor in the Green Coat Fund. Um, so uh, for those people who are not familiar in the audience, uh, the Green Investment Bank's been up and running for about two years now. It was established um, in 20, uh, 2012 um, as UKGI in 2013. It, it became UK Green Investment Bank. And it, and it was born out of the, uh, the recession, the early days of the recession, and there was cross-party support for the bank. We've got £3.8 billion of our money to invest in renewable projects. And as some of them were saying earlier, that, that is nowhere near enough for the UK's requirement for renewable projects, which is in the order of £200 billion or £300 billion. So, so our role as a development bank is to mobilise other capital into projects. So we're not just a straight investor, as perhaps some of the other people on the panel are. And perhaps sometimes I, w I think we might wish we were, because li life might be a little bit easier. We have to invest in both green projects and uh, um, profitable projects, and the green criteria is important to us as the investment uh, return, although there is no trade-off one for the other. Um, and because of our uh, state aid mandate, which was, which was uh, put together pretty quickly, I have to say, we have three main sectors, offshore wind, waste and bioenergy, and industrial commercial energy efficiency. And then we added another sector, community scale renewables onshore, um, just a, a few months ago, which is really 18 megawatt wind and 8 megawatt hydro. Um, so we have quite a narrow focus. And, and, and what we're constantly looking for is the gap in the financing market for particular projects. So we're always looking for trouble, I think is probably the best way to characterize it. We're always looking for the problem areas, which, which makes life kind of difficult. Um, not to find the areas, but to work out how to do it and to do it in such a profitable way. And, and, and I, I tend to 
describes certainly my role in the, on the energy efficiency desk as trying to match the capital with the projects and the projects to the capital. The capital often doesn't talk the language of the projects and the projects often don't talk the language of capital. And there's a bit of a gap in between. And that, that's really, I think, comes about in, if you think about development capital, construction capital and operating capital and operating capital being green coat where, where we were talking just now. It's at the front end, it's the operating capital, which is, which is the real problem. There, there is uh, nowhere near the, the number of projects we would like to see coming through the pipeline at the moment that we could invest in, um, which as a consequence means that we have to get involved in projects at a much, much earlier stage than, than perhaps some of my colleagues on the left here would. Uh, uh, I'm sure most people really like to get involved in a project at the point of just signing, but we have to get involved in a project. And, and, and sometimes there just is insufficient development capital even to structure the project in the first place, and we get involved in that. But on the upside, there's some interesting things that we are doing, uh, trying to bring technology from abroad into the UK, which is, which is really interesting and, and needed. Um, it's, it, it may not have a particular operating experience with, for instance, the waste streams that we have in the UK. And so trying to give investors confidence that we believe it's a good project. Um, sometimes, as, and in fact, a number of occasions, has helped to mobilise other people's capital and provide that level of confidence. I think some people even have suggested, going back to when we first started talking, that uh, if the Green Investment Bank invests in a, in a project, then it's unlikely the government will change its, its, uh, its subsidy regimes. I think that's not true. We, don't, we, don't, we can't and we don't influence government, and they don't. Uh, they don't control what we do. We are at arm's length from government. We have one shareholder representative through the, through the Department of Beers. But we do certainly look at the regulatory environment, perhaps in a lot more detail than some other people do, and we are much closer to some of the government departments. And it's our single point of focus. It's the only th sectors that we can invest in. Does that help? Yes, it does. Um, could you... Oh, green coat, sorry. Yes, please. So, so, so one of the things that we... Um, recognised quite early on, which was in the days of UKGI when we were at Biz, was that the recycling of capital, and this was with Green Coat, recycling of capital was a really, really big issue. The, the requirement for just offshore wind farms was way beyond the market capitalisation of a lot of the companies bidding for those projects, and if something wasn't done, then it would all come to a grinding halt once they'd re reached their capacity. And so the opportunity to be a cornerstone investor along with SSE in, into Green Coat was one which we thought was helpful. Um, it, it has both offshore wind and onshore wind. Onshore wind is not in mandate apart from small scale renewables for us. Uh, so the, the, uh, our investment is held by biz and not by, by us directly. It's a way of sort of circumnavigating state aid rules. Um, but nonetheless, it's proved to be extremely successful, as Stephen has been pointing out. And it's something which we would like to replicate, perhaps in other sectors as well. Um, coming back over here, in, in, in this environment where you've got organisations at the sort of operational stage um, doing more, um, Inga, where are the opportunities for um, firms like yours to, to play a role? Well, <clears throat> in fact, they are twofold. On the one hand, uh, we do pretty much the same as uh, our colleague with Infinis. This is also a, I would say, after all, utility type of uh, excellence in operations and development-oriented business, which is now stock-listed since uh, November of last year, and um, pays a 7 to 8% uh, dividend yield and attracts investors because of that. Um, apart from that, if you uh, then go after new funds, new money, new opportunities, you in fact have the yield curves and uh, their approach to the market. I think you described it very well, uh, if you really look into it, what it is. Um, of course, they go after what I would call the plain vanilla or the clean assets, where most of the issues are fixed. So O&M contracts, long term, are in place. Um, financing is optimized and in place. Offtake is normally outright uh, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, there's a management team, so then of course it's a question of cost of capital and uh, very big people with a lot of money and cheap cost of capital, they are around and they bid for these assets. And you have that segment and, well, it works according to those 
levers and uh, economics. And then you have another field, I would say, on the opposite. And certainly also something in between, uh, but I think by describing the, the, uh, the two polarizing segments, it becomes clear to you. Uh, on the other hand, you have the difficult deals, the complex ones. You, you mentioned it as well. Uh, yes, where you need a lot of competence in addressing non-existing O&M. You don't have PPAs in place, but you need to source them in the specific market where your plant produces power. Um, financing may be unlevered, for example. There are a lot of assets from utilities that come to the market which effectively are unlevered. Sometimes uh, the financing is distressed. And uh, so you have to come up with a bunch of competences uh, and fix problems, which uh, to the current shareholders uh, appear to be insolvable, unaddressable. And uh, when you're good at that, and if you go after larger, portfolios, which is our case. So equity check sizes over 200, I would say up to 800 or even a billion of dollars. Then competition, the competitive landscape around those opportunities is completely different from what yield curves would target. And this is what we do. And then certainly you have also all shades of gray in between. Sure. Edward, would you like to, um, to, to comment on that as well in terms of Sorry, I know you guys are saying, <laughs> just we, it seems inappropriate not to give you a chance to say we, we often see terra firma in the same space that we are looking at as well. So, I mean, as a fund, uh, you know, you have to, um, you know, generate higher returns than a direct investor can, uh, or pension fund uh, can do. So you therefore need to go after more uh, complex uh, situations to kind of create that alpha or that kind of extra uh, return. Um, so, you know, it, the whole market, I think, is, as we look at it, has commoditized uh, to a large extent, uh, you know, wind technology, solar technology specifically, um, you know, has become an investment uh, class for, you know, the common good and, and pension funds can do that directly, uh, particularly if they are operational. Um, so, so you need to look for new markets. Um, you know, when we started investing in the uh, renewable space, and we established our joint venture with uh, with Sun Edison. You know, that they were building their first project in Italy, which was a 70 megawatt project, and we committed, uh, you know, taking care of the financing and funding of that that project. Uh, but we also uh, put aside another 100 million US dollars to build out another 19 projects on the back of that. So at this moment in time, we're looking at a portfolio that we built out together with our partner over a, about two year period in different ge uh, geographies um, and, and created that uh, 250 megawatt operational uh, portfolio. So they looked at it and said, okay, we want to have one pot of money and one partner that we can you know, create uh, such, a, such a portfolio, and that's worth more than maybe selling each of the individual assets at the best price, because then maybe they would have only developed three or four projects as opposed to 20 projects because they focused on what they're good at, which is uh, building projects. Well, now, Sun Edison is now probably one of the largest uh, solar developers, owners uh, in the world, and they also uh, launched their own yield co. Uh, in the US and they traded up like 30, 40% on the first day of trading simply because of the disconnect in the, in the market uh, that, uh, that, that currently exists in, in, in the US. Um, but we are continuing to work together with the Sun Edison team and now the Terraform team uh, as well. So people might have seen the announcement that we actually teamed to begin with Terraform uh, to build out a warehouse facility. So basically we're building out projects uh, for Terraform uh, over time, and then when the projects are matured, we will then drop uh, those projects into the uh, yield co. Um, so we have, to some extent, a kind of guaranteed exit at a certain pre-agreed uh, valuation methodology. So we're trying to be yeah, creative about, uh, you know, yes, yield co is a competitor, but you know, if you can't beat them, let's join them, and that's what we are kind of trying to trying to do by uh, being creative. Um, but you know, also need to continue to look at new areas where maybe other people don't necessarily uh, want to take the risk. So you go to, to new areas. 
Uh, so one market that we looked at, and I don't know if I'm going ahead of your script, but uh, was, for example, Mexico, which is an, uh, an, a new uh, geography with a huge potential, lots of wind, lots of solar. Um, you know, the market uh, characteristics are you know, becoming a lot more investable uh, in comparison, say, maybe five or ten years ago. Um, so we picked it as a market and said, well, we understand what's happening there. We feel comfortable. Um, and with Renovalia, which is our uh, Spanish partner in our wind portfolio, we decided, okay, let's go after the Spanish market and let's try to build out a couple of projects in that market. So we built out a project, you know, as we, again, one of the first players in that market uh, and took that risk, um, uh, you know, with the right partner and under the right uh, conditions. And now we have a 250 megawatt of operational wind in Mexico. But in the meantime, uh, you know, there's an enormous yield compression going on as well in that particular sector, <laughs> where you know people come to us again with like you know projects that you know need uh, you know very low returns uh, for for you to be successful in some kind of auction process. So it seems to be that you know what's required for a market or to to mature is is probably even faster than you know what we saw in in, in recent years. So therefore, we yeah, we need to stay ahead of the game, do complicated things. Uh, and, and, and find a way of, of adding value. Um, and, and, and that's you know, what, what I guess our investors pay us for, uh, to, to do that and think creatively about the opportunity set that's out there for us. You, you mentioned partnerships, um, and uh, how important are they in terms of going into new markets, um, potentially with new technologies? Uh, is it something you would do without sort of trusted partners, whether they are from the, 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 the target country or, for, or, or take, them, take them with you from, from here? Yeah, no, we, like if you look at the First Reserve model, I mean, we, First Reserve is a big private equity group uh, by origin, so we have about $30 billion on the management in the, in the business. And you know, 26 of that is actually invested in kind of uh, private equity portfolio companies. And the whole private equity model is about partnering with management teams and backing them in, in growing platforms. And you know, the history of First Reserve was originally on you know, backing EMP teams and go out and drill for oil in all kinds of funky places. And a, a lot of that was driven by you know, partnering with the right people and the right partners locally to make that happen. So I think that model uh, has been also adopted in the infrastructure business. Um, is to find the right companies to, to back and the right teams to, to, to partner with. Um, that could be either uh, you know, a local team um, or it could be somebody just has a need and therefore there's a kind of a good kind of win-win situation. But I think it starts always with the uh, evaluation of, uh, of, 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 of a partner and the, yeah, the need for some kind of win-win situations. We also want to be a value-added partner to them. We not just want to be a ca capital provider. Um, and for example, we partnered earlier this year with uh, Covanta Energy, uh, which is a, uh, one of the largest waste to energy companies in, in the world. Um, and um, the, uh, the uh, you know, they needed, they, they were developing a project here in Europe, in, in Ireland, which is a 550 million euro waste to energy uh, project. And they had been looking of kind of project financing that uh, particular project, and that was not an easy, um, project uh, by any stretch of the imagination. They were not used in actually uh, f you know, f looking for non-recourse project financing in a European market. Um, and we actually kind of teamed up with uh, Covanta in, in early days and actually were an, uh, yeah, instrumental in making the project bankable. So we were actually involved in what you mentioned to earlier, designing the EPC contract, designing the O&M contract. You know, we were you know, intrinsically involved in creating you know, a room half this size in paperwork that ultimately had to be signed in September this year. So we worked on that for two and a half years to deploy only 75 million dollars of, of, sorry, euros of, uh, of equity. But that, became, you know, and Covanta stuck with us for two and a half years as well as an equity partner, while there were many moments that they could have maybe gone away and found cheaper sources of capital because we truly established a partnership where we became an, almost a part of the development team uh, to, to establish that business. Um, so it's kind of finding those type of opportunities where there's mutual loyalty um, and, and value add. Yeah, because I, don't, yeah, I understand the waste to energy business, but don't ask me to build one. And that's clearly something that waste that Covanta is a lot better at. 
uh, and they're also a lot better in, in kind of managing the relationships with the, the city council and the, and the ultimate client that is uh, ultimately going to be providing the uh, regulatory uh, backing to, to this particular project. So there's a kind of win-win to establish those type of partnerships. Great. Um, Mathieu, on the, on the topic of opportunities outside Europe, you listed off a number of different countries and, and regions before where EDF has interests. If you had to sort of name your top, I'll give, I'll give, I'll give you three. You can have as many of them as you like. Uh, countries at the moment or parts of the world where you think there's good opportunity, where would they be and, um, and what's particularly interesting about it? Well, it's a difficult question because there are many countries uh, looking at uh, renewables. The, the truth is you know, most countries are looking for a cheaper way of uh, producing electricity and renewables, solar, onshore, are quite uh, uh, cheap, and they are, they are becoming the you know one of the cheapest way of producing electricity. So wherever you go, people are looking at renewables. Uh, so the, the question is, okay, where is the regulatory regime uh, mature enough? Uh, where there is an history of backing investors, so not changing, you know, position uh, uh, all the time, and where uh, are the good projects? And uh, I think it, we have example of very successful uh, auction process in Brazil uh, recently, where uh, a lot of people have been attracted by this market. Um, EDF has not invested in Brazil uh, yet, but we're certainly looking at, at it. I think uh, so South America, I think, is attracting a lot of uh, developers uh, uh, of uh, uh, renewable projects. Uh, there are some markets, and, and, and I think South America want to uh, attract the investors. And they would like uh, not just the developers, but the supply chain to uh, you know, build uh, an industry there. So they are really trying hard, I think, to, to bring the investors. In Asia, it's a bit more difficult. Um, you know, there are some local uh, investors there, and they want to protect them a little bit more. So it's, it's very difficult to invest in a country like China, for example, or even India. You know, the culture is, is a bit different, uh, so it's more difficult. And then you have, I think, if we look at Europe at the moment, North Europe seems to be the area where people uh, find a, a, a few uh, attractive uh, opportunities. Um, and I, I, I think if we look at Africa, because Africa needs energy, so I think in the long term, we should see a lot of projects being built there. Unfortunately, the framework is not in place yet, so we are looking at really specific countries. And of the countries in Africa where most things are happening, at the moment, it's South Africa. But I think we will see more investment, uh, I hope, uh, uh, being uh, happening in, in Africa. OK, I'm going to go to questions in just a moment. So if the roving mics are in position, that would be great. But before we do, I wanted to talk about green bonds briefly. And Paul, I'll come to you for some comments on this in just a moment. But first, back to Malcolm. Uh, we've seen uh, a sort of meteoric uh, rise from a very low base. Uh, of, uh, of um, green bond issuance over the last couple of years. Everybody seems to be talking about it. Uh, is it worth the hype? <clears throat> well, I think time will tell whether it's really worth the hype, as you say. Um, there is an awful lot of interest, and we um, anything <clears throat> that, that moves the agenda forward from our point of view is quite <laughs> useful. <clears throat> we have seen people like Sainsbury's have issued a green bond, which I think people are familiar with. Um, I think it's important to point out that there may be other reasons why some of these organisations are issuing green bonds. Sainsbury's can raise money, it doesn't need to raise money with a green tinge. It's raising money with a green tinge, I think, because it wants to make a public statement to both its customers and shareholders that it's interested in investing in green technologies. And they have, as I understand it, an agency alongside them that will authenticate that that money gets invested into green projects, which is a similar sort of role that we pay with our projects. Um, but in no way, as I understand it, does the finance rely on the performance of those technologies. It is uh, purely a corporate bond. But nonetheless, it is a very useful statement on the part of that company that they do intend to, to invest in green technologies and invest in a serious way as opposed to just issuing a few case studies. And it, it, it gives that quantum of, of investment that they're making. So <clears throat> we think it's good. I, I think uh, we, if there was the opportunity to do it uh, for some people that might, might find it a bit difficult, I think we'd be interested in doing that under certain circumstances, and that would be quite specific circumstances. 
uh, particularly with large industrial commercial customers, we would be interested. But, but um, I think time will tell whether, whether it's really hype or not, and that, and that really will play out in terms of whether those companies really do reduce their carbon emissions and really do go you know, zero carbon ultimately, which is, which, which, which is where I think they're ultimately heading. Paul? <coughs> Yeah, no, I think we'd agree with everything uh, Malcolm said. I, I think the one maybe sort of additional twist on it is that I think the, the green bonds are an interesting way potentially of financing some of the uh, energy efficiency and portfolio things that people are trying to do. I think one of the challenges we always find uh, with energy efficiency and portfolios is just getting the scale to bring them into the, the bank market and into the project finance space. So it's often difficult um, to, to get enough of those sort of projects together to make sense of bringing it to the bank market and doing it as a, as a project financing. So some of the things that Sainsbury's and others are trying to do in the, in the realms of energy efficiency where each, each sort of store efficiency program might be a, like a, just a million pounds just to pick a number out of the air, you know, to, to finance that in the bank market with project finance debt is actually quite difficult, whereas bringing it into a sort of a green bond, no, noting everything Malcolm said about these being not really project finance uh, instruments, they are more, you know, the mobilization of capital behind the sort of greenness of something. Um, you know, it, it, is, it is a way that they can see to bring you know, new capital to bear on some of those portfolio and uh, 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 energy efficiency opportunities. If I can just add, I, th I think that, I mean, that's really, really important, the, the aggregation issue in terms of energy efficiency. And, and added to that, um, <clears throat> um, it is unlikely that well, if they want to do energy efficiency and it's highly disaggregated as, as you were talking about, this is the cheapest way you can possibly ever service that requirement and, and service that requirement in a way that's quite public and, and, I, and I, I applaud that sort of approach. It, it, it's probably not the best way for some of the very largest projects but certainly for the small stores with relatively small investments, I, I'd agree with you entirely. Okay. Uh, questions. There are mics around the place. Uh, hopefully you've had time to think of some interesting things. Um, please do tell us who you are before asking your question and direct it as you will. Don't all rush to put your hand on one. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Philip Hismans. I represent uh, Unicus. Um, and we are a storage uh, uh, company. Um, I have a general question, though, and that relates to the uh, term carbon bubble. I would have thought that I uh, would have heard that uh, term at least once in a panel on renewable energy finance. And so I'm just wondering uh, if uh, anybody would want to chip in on that. And uh, uh, why, I guess my second part of the question is, why do we see so little uh, of what I would think is misallocated money uh, flowing into uh, some very viable renewable projects, which I'm happy to talk to you about one-on-one. Uh, um, -on -one. Thanks. Who'd like to take on the carbon bubble? <laughs> that might be your answer. Um. I'm, 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 happy to, I'm happy to comment. I mean, you know, carbon prices, as you know, otherwise you wouldn't have asked the question, are very low. So in a way, they're kind of meaningless in, in the current um, you know, landscape. Uh, you know, will that recover? Will that improve? You know, people, you know, Bloomberg, Bloomberg new, new Energy Finance probably has a view on that and probably says it will uh, because it's on the foundation of the of that <laughs> institution. Um, but it's yeah, we'll we'll have to see that that's going to happen. I mean, power prices are low, carbon prices are low. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's not necessarily really things that I spend a lot of time thinking about at this moment in time. Perhaps I can just <clears throat> uh, add one comment to this. Um, yes, the prices are low and they are set to remain low. And uh, I'm also wondering why we are concentrating so much on this peculiar way of uh, driving the economy. Of course, it would be a good solution if uh, if, if it was a market solution, but it is not a market solution. Because right from the outset, you allocate, uh, you allocate certain volumes. And those volumes which you allocate are a function of what you see will be produced by different sectors over the next five years. So you have a lot of assumptions, which are normally wrong, and therefore you don't get the supply and uh, demand balance right. And therefore, as of today, you are in uh, excess of, uh, of quotas, and therefore the prices are low. 
and uh, I have difficulties to see why that should change. Therefore, I would also think that uh, by fixing targets for renewable power generation as a share of the overall final energy consumption, I think this is a much more straightforward way in order to incentivize investment, of course, in the most efficient way. So, for example, through auctions. And your comment with regard to technologies, well, I think storage is in the same ballpark as some other less mature renewable power generation technologies. And uh, if you look back over the last century, we started with hydro, and hydro was then the um, springboard for coal, because coal was not competitive with hydro 100 years ago, okay? Uh, then we went on with oil, and uh, we then introduced nuclear. Nuclear was not at all competitive to what had been installed before, so I would say whenever you want to diversify more your energy mix, you have to let in new technologies. And this is as true for, for example, offshore, which is today not competitive against onshore, we all know that, not even against solar PV. But I think it's worth the effort. You shouldn't overdo, but you need some. And the same is true for storage. We should have it, but you must give some time in order to develop the technologies. Can I add, add to that as well? I think, I think that, uh, um, certainly, certainly in the UK, I think, I think that what you've got is, um, yes, you have sort of low carbon targets, but actually what's, what, if, if, you know, I, I've, I've tried to sell equity in the last couple of years. Um, in, the, in the autumn last year, you had a whole lot of political debate about the power price. Um, this year, when we, when we, when we raised equity, um, <clears throat> hardly anyone talked about that at all. All that they wanted to talk about was security supply. So actually, you have different issues um, as, as sort of time goes by. One thing I would also note as well is that um, the, sort of the, 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 the sort of the intrinsic conservatism in the, in the UK is probably quite helpful. NIMBYism is not a bad thing <laughs> in some ways because we're actually quite a long way behind where some other countries are. And so in, in terms of, say, Germany, you've arguably got too much renewable, technology, uh, uh, renewable capacity. So you, you get times where it's windy and, and, and the power price is almost zero. So, so actually in the UK, we're, we're not necessarily in, in, in a bad place. And there will be other parts of Europe where this is sort of, uh, this is sort of the case as well. Um, I mean, I, I'm a great believer that um, we'll probably have somewhere in the region of 30% renewables. I'm not sure we should have any more. Uh, and this is, this is really about how, how a, a, a balanced market works. I think we need quite a bit more nuclear. And I think the, the nimbyism, if you think there's nimbyism about onshore wind, you just wait until we start building nuclear in this country, having spent the first six years of my career in the nuclear industry. So, so I, I think that we'll end up with something like 30% nuclear, 30% um, renewables and 40% and, and, and gas, which will come in and, and sort of help the, 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 the intermittency of predominantly wind, in general view. I have a feeling the question, before we go to another one, you say carbon bubble? Yeah, that's there. Uh, so, so, you, so will you I'm, get... I'm, I'm talking about the, the fact that, uh, I mean, if we, if we take the latest IPCC report just to say one thing, if, uh, you know, if, if we're serious about that, that means we can... To, uh, to stay within the two degree, uh, uh, two degree uh, uh, goal, we can burn, uh, with an 80% pro uh, probability, we can burn one fifth of all proven recoverable reserves. The equity markets nowadays assume that we can burn 100% of that, i.e. that policymakers will absolutely do nothing, zero, uh, uh, not even you know, go down to 20%. And that, uh, some people have argued, is a huge bubbling, the same way a bubble, the same way the housing bubble worked. Uh, and um, that would, of course, if, it, if it's true, I believe it's true, uh, be, represent a huge misallocation of equity capital. So just, I mean, the, I think a lot of, uh, most institutions recognize that as a risk, but is the issue not about timing? Is that, you know, when is this a problem? I remember in Australia having a discussion with a number of banks and they were like, we recognise that it could be a problem, but it's very hard to get out of assets today which are doing what they've always done. Um, that's a very hard argument to make to shareholders, so to speak. So would anyone like to, to comment on, are we going to stay far away from that for the time being? Nods all around. <laughs> we'll leave the elephant standing in the corner somewhere. Uh, anyone else with a question? We'll take, we'll take one last question and then we'll close the panel. And the lady, perhaps, in the back. 
<laughs> Sorry. I've been told to <laughs> ask a question. Sorry. Uh, David Buchan from the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies. Um, I don't want to deprive the lady at the back of a question, so um, I'll be brief. What is, uh, just like the panel's view, and perhaps maybe to uh, Malcolm Ball of the, um, uh, the Green Investment Bank, just do you have any views about the initiative launched yesterday by the European Commission, uh, which is uh, the, the public-private partnership to use some EU money, some little bit of EIB capital to leverage a, a large amount, you know, over 300 billion, uh, in, um, in various forms of investment, but also energy. I just wondered whether you, um, this I think builds on a EIB, European Investment Bank um, uh, initiative, much smaller of in recent years. Um, I don't know how successful that's been. Anyway, I'm just interested in the panel's views on that. Thank you. I guess I'll just start off on that one. Um, so it is very, very new. Um, I've only read a short briefing on it, so I, I, I have to say that I, I haven't seen any detail on exactly what that means. It, it seems to indicate some uh, in, investment in infrastructure. Um, I, my understanding is most of it is, is destined to go to southern Europe, not, not to the UK or, or certainly northern Europe. So it, I think I, I can't really answer you. I'd love to answer your question. I don't think I can answer your question because it is so, so hot off the press. So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Maybe the only thing I can say is that you know, there's a whole phenomenon of development institutions and kind of what the role they play. Um, and you know, I think that the Green Investment Bank has been good in, in terms of you know, finding a particular niche that doesn't go head on you know, with capital that we uh, provide, although that does sometimes happen. Um, uh, so you know, if this is another pot of money that will actually uh, compete with you know, uh, private sources of capital, I don't think that that is something that I, I would welcome because basically they just drive down returns in markets um, and, and that doesn't help anybody. Um, and, um, you know, so that's, uh, I don't know exactly what they're trying to do, but that is the thing that I would be mindful of, that they have a very specific focus on what they want to do. And if there is a private capital available, then that should uh, have priority. Uh, I do think there's a lot of capital available at the moment. I think there's more infrastructure capital available through infrastructure funds, through pension funds, uh, through yield codes and, and all the types of vehicles. So. Yeah, even debt markets are, you know, still booming, uh, and I haven't seen a liquidity uh, availability like this uh, since 2007. Um, so it's, uh, you know, I think that, you know, if this is again like more money that goes into the same pot and competes for the same projects, I, I wouldn't welcome that. That's just a, one quick comment from my side as well. Well, I haven't read the paper either. Um, I think it's not overly deterministic. Uh, uh, as, as we are speaking today, uh, I would hope and I would also imagine that it will serve the purpose of creating the conditions for more competition, and this would mean in particular increased investment into infrastructure like transmission lines for power. They were not built for large trades or large import and export. They were only built over the last century for security of supply, so you could do much more within certain countries and across the borders in order to make energy flow uh, in larger quantities. And uh, that is also true for gas. Think of the gas supply situation in Western Europe where we have at least some LNG terminals and can replace Russian gas. This is not the case for the Eastern European countries. And last but not least, think of Italy. We have now digital meters in Italy operating for 10 years. And we don't have that in most other parts of Europe. Well, I think there's ample space to deploy much of that capital in those things which at the bottom create uh, the conditions for increased competitiveness and don't interfere with private capital. I think we got one more. Uh, just wanted to ask your views on when you do the financing, how do you take into account of the political risk? Um, 
we've talked about like the, the, the security of supply and also um, the green targets, but I guess the part that we haven't really talked about is the affordability of renewables, um, especially if you look at the UK, for example, most of the new investment are effectively being paid by the taxpayers. Um, do you see any risks that one day the UK um, population is going to wake up and realize it's too expensive, we can't afford this, and therefore the UK government is going to have a U-turn on the green policies? Uh, what's your view on that? Thank you. I think we did talk a bit about that before, but... Um, I'm sorry I, if I missed that. <coughs> That's OK. I, I just wanted to summarise what we said before. Well, uh, I think what we said is uh, you know, the, the industry is, uh, is where no, it's not where it was 15 years ago, 10 years ago, or five years ago, and things have matured a lot. So to start with, there was some uh, support available, which were quite expensive, and that's why we had this change in regulation uh, to avoid uh, this, this cost to be uh, too, too high for the consumers. So the, where we are today is is by all means avoiding uh, the uh, investment to, um, to increase the customer bill. And I think if we look at the UK, the, you know, the cost of uh, re renewables to the uh, consumer bill is, is relatively low. Um, so is it, uh, and I think uh, it was also mentioned, you know, what we're looking at as investors is investing in, in countries where we think it's sustainable. So regulation regime basically doesn't put too much uh, weight or, or, uh, and cause too much increase in, in the bills, in the customer bills. So that's what we try to look at is where is it sustainable to invest in? And to be sustainable, it needs to be affordable. And uh, is it affordable now? It's a lot more affordable than it was. Some technologies like offshore are less affordable, um, but uh, certainly if we speak of solar, if we speak of onshore, they are affordable technology. And so uh, if they are rightly deployed uh, with the right investment, it doesn't cost uh, uh, that much. And it's competitive. Okay, I think we are out of time. Uh, thank you all very much for being here, and please join me in thanking the panel for their... <laughs>